Hi, my name's Greg Twemlow. I'm the founder of a registered charity called the Seven Mile Venture Lab, and we're based on Sydney's Northern Beaches. Earlier this year, we received a grant from the Australian Department of Veterans Affairs titled Saluting Their Service. And the pitch we had given was the idea of finding veterans in the Northern Beaches, shooting the videos in conjunction with high school students, for most of them, and recording that into a film that we can release and make it available. Our very first interview is with Wal Edwards, OAM. Wal is a pretty special person. In a couple of months, he'll be celebrating his 104th birthday. He is, by any measure, an amazing person. We made the video in his home in Manly on August 12, 2020. And we were very delighted when our local member of parliament, James Griffin, agreed to be the interviewer. It was a fantastic afternoon. We did the whole setup. Our videography partner, Luna Media Productions and Catalan Anastase was there with us doing a wonderful job. I think you're really going to enjoy hearing Wall's story and his philosophies on life. I think you'll really enjoy the interview. Hi, I'm James Griffin. I'm the State Member for Manly and Parliamentary Secretary for Veterans in New South Wales. And today I've got the opportunity to speak to Wal Edwards OAM. Wal's turning 104 this November and he's got a rich history and a story that most of us could simply dream of. I want to thank the Department of Veterans Affairs for providing this funding to enable us to tell the story of Wal and other veterans across the Northern Beaches. Well, I was happening to be uh, a little bit older than most people on the 3rd, 3rd of September 1939. I happened to be 23 years old. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh boy, this is mad, Th this Hitler and what he's up to and what not and uh, where's this going to end? Mm. And from then on, you want to know when I was first called up? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it was three years after that. You see, I came from a very poor family, lived in Newcastle, Hamilton, and uh, we, we went through the Great Depression. Mm -hmm and where a lot of people had no money. Mm -hmm. They were suffering. Suffering that much that uh, I had to leave school after doing the intermediate certificate and come, and, uh, come down to Manly to live. Oh. You can think about that. Yep. That's coming from hell to heaven on earth. <laughs> Well, a lot of people will, will and share. I was wondering what yeah, it's yeah. like. No, that's a, as a member for Manly, I share your view. You, you did come to, to heaven. Um, that's, that's right. It's a, a great place to live. And it is. How different was it back then when you got here? Oh, yes. It's fantastic because I, I saw the surf and then I saw the pool. And don't forget, I was only about f bit over 15 mm. then. I thought, three, three. This is great. And they used to have a, a circus in Gilbert Park. Yeah. And then there was Bert's milk, milk bar there. And wow. you could go up and down the Corso, <laughs> you know, and there wouldn't be too many people there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I used to go on the surf at the weekend, get all burnt up, and Seeing I'm fairly fair, mm. I got burned up. <laughs> <laughs> but then next next week, mm -hmm. I, I'd get over the peeling mm -hmm. and go back again, oh, have wow. another go. So that was great. And and then I I, I happened to get a job at uh, Macalas, the grocers uh -huh. in the Corso. I don't know whether you remember them or not. No, no. Ah, oh, dear. 
and uh, I was the boy. Uh -huh. I had my own bicycle, and uh, if if uh, Manly Hospital ran out of uh, anything, mm. the boy would take it up. <laughs> and I ended up taking a 70-pound bag of sugar up on handlebars on my bike one day. So you're getting <laughs> you can up, imagine that. Getting up Darley Road on, <laughs> on a bike with... Yeah, but at that age, oh. yeah. And you know what? I got 18 and 9 a week for that. Mm -hmm. And I got the sack three years <laughs> afterwards because they had to pay me two pounds and sixpence. Oh, no. <laughs> but they did me a great turn. Yep. Because I thought, well... Here we are in a great uh, depression here. I got the sack. Mm. I went up to Waters Cash and Gary and I said, hey, Mr. Curry, uh, do you want to make more money? Mm. He said, everyone does son these days. Mm -hmm. I said, would you give me 10% if I bring in orders for you and y you deliver them? Mm. He said, yes. And that within about three or four weeks, I was earning twice as much as what I was <laughs> earning at McElroy's. So I went back to uh, Aussie uh, Rear, yeah. and I said, thanks for giving me A the sack. <laughs> <laughs> he said, why? I said, I've learned, you, uh, I've learned a lesson. Mm. I'll never ever work for a boss again in my life. I haven't. <laughs> Here we go. Well, you, you, so <laughs> was it that bad back then? In, I mean, I think one of the amazing elements of being able to talk to you is, is to really get an appreciation and an understanding of how bad things were. I mean, we can read right. about it in a history book. And they were tough, and I'm, I'm very sad to think of what's going on now with this COVID-19 mm. and the number of people that are losing their loved ones. Mm. What for? Mm. Mm. Why? Mm. And the th trouble is, it's just around the corner. Mm. You never know who's going to get it, do you? Do you feel any parallels between how people uh, and communities came together and and supported one another during war or depression, and and at the same time uh, today with COVID? Is there are there any similarities at all that you see? Well, yes. Mm. Uh, it's it's getting to a stage where people do care what's going on they do mm. and and they want to contribute and that's good and that's very much what your life has been about uh, service in many different forms yes that's it i mean after all i i did uh, join rotary mm -hmm. uh, in 1965 and i'm still in it mm. and that the motto is service of ourself mm -hmm. you know all about that yes yes and each each year we uh, we have the Christmas tree of joy in St Ives mm -hmm. and uh, there's a number of nursing homes and hospitals mm -hmm. and war vets that I personally uh, visit and get their names, their age and what they're like for Christmas, mm -hmm. put it on the card and the public, we educate them over the years and they look forward to it mm. and they contribute and buy the presents. That's wonderful. And then my son and I deliver it in his truck. And, and, <laughs> and that, that's just a small part of your, the work you've done as a welfare officer um, for, for veterans in our community. Yes, I mean, uh, well, the reason I was determined to do something really positive and volunteered to be the welfare officer hardware diggers, I'd gone through a lot of grieving in my lifetime and mm -hmm. losing loved ones. Uh, I lost a son who was 28 and a grandson at uh, 38, and a, a wife at, uh, uh, later on. And that, uh, you know, it uh, makes you wonder, you know, how, how much do you have to mm. go through in life? Mm. And I thought, well, how can I contribute? And I thought, well, now I know. What about, what about the men that served in World War II, mm -hmm. Vietnam, and all these other places. And, you know, it's sad. When they come back, to come back from being in the services, to get back into the civilian life, mm. and they're, they're, they're not the same men. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm gonna help them. Yep, and you've done that. Uh, well, I showed, the, showed you the records. Yep. Yep. 
There's hundreds there. Mm. You've seen their names. Mm -hmm. You've seen the ones that died on there. Yeah. Well, ha then somebody, someone has to always be doing this. Mm. And I recommend that everyone should think about it every day mm -hmm. of their life. Get up in the morning, get hate and anger out of their heart, Stop worrying about yourself because there's always someone worse off you down the street mm. and you can go and pick them up, can't you? Yep, yep. You're going to even help someone going up and down the course out mm. no, if, if he good advice. needs help. You, you mentioned um, the Vietnam War and the Vietnam veterans. Yeah. H how did, what was your observation? Because that was a really difficult time when they came back oh, yeah. and, and weren't really respected. Yeah, they weren't recognised mm. enough. Mm. But we do, mm. we do. And, and did you recall having various, I mean, what, what, how did you feel given your service and then seeing these, these people come back from Vietnam and there was a lot of confusion about why they were there and oh. what was going on. But do you feel now, uh, decades on, that, uh, and I certainly do, that, that there's a lot better understanding and appreciation of what that um, conflict was about and a lot more respect for our, our veterans. Oh, well, uh, look at the ones coming from Afghanistan too. Mm, mm. Look how long they've been ah, tied up to it. Mm. Uh, well, we often wonder when, when is all this going to end and uh, when are the ex servicemen? going to be recognised as a human being, for them coming back, I mean, people in civilian life, they, they cannot realise what it's like because you've only got to be in it for a very small time to know, hey, I'm not in charge of anything. I can't do anything. I'm subject to someone else giving me orders. No, I'm used to my own decisions in life, and someone else is telling me what to do. Mm. You go, joking. Mm -mm. When, when I, I did not join up, I, I was called up mm. at the time. I had two children. Mm. I was 26. One was two, one was three. Mm. And I thought, oh God, I've gone up from this. Here I am, I went through the Great Depression, I worked hard, I, I, I own this house, and I own the house next door, and I feel as though I'm, I'm secure in life, I've made it. Yep. And here I am, I'm called up to serve the country, which, uh, you know, someone has to, but for me, it, it seems, you know, it's, mm. A bit unusual to earn something like six shillings a day they're mm. talking about. Mm. Well, I, earn, I can earn plenty of money outside. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> but see, that happened. But then I changed my mind. Mm -hmm. You know what changed it? What? Okay. The Japs came into, into our harbour mm. and started mucking up. That was about a month after I, I was in the army. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh hey, I'm, I'm not going to be called a chocker now. Mm -hmm. I joined the AIF. <laughs> so it was that that moment. That, um, that, that moment. The, the, that, the mini subs came into the harbour and, and yes, uh, you know. Um, so that prompted you to say, right, enough's enough, and, and off you went. Yeah. And had to say essentially goodbye to your two-year-old and. Uh, yeah, or you had two, two and two, three. Two, year old, yeah, yeah, yeah. That must have been a very difficult decision to. Uh, well, it wasn't a decision of mine. Mm. I was called up. Mm. We had to go in mm. then. And um, then, so, so that war then takes place. Um, how did you feel when it was all over? Well, I felt, felt oh dear. Well, at last I can start living again like a normal human being. But I felt as though, you know, nobody seemed to care too much about whether you had been a soldier or whether you, you know, 
we're just living an ordinary life. So I wandered around and was uh, thinking about what I'll do and what I won't do and I sold the two houses I had in Leichhardt and uh, I built another one in Lane Cove and I was there for a few years. Uh, not many years there, and but then uh, I was asked by manager of uh, a tannery, his name was Bill Duck, he said, well, I see what you're doing for your place there, you've done, got a nice garden and everything, you're a good worker. He said, well, I'd like to go into partnership with you in a dairy farm. Hmm. I said, dairy farm? <laughs> I said, look, I've been used to sleeping on the land, I love the land. I said, I've been living in tents for four years, <laughs> you know, and all of this. Well, uh, well, I think it's a good idea too. Hmm. <laughs> so we went, went up and down the, the country and we found a place down in 200 acres down at, uh, outside of Cabago, mm -hmm. uh, at Cooler Glot. Yep. And there was 56 milking cows. Mm -hmm. And because I had, had, had anything to do with a cow, <laughs> but now I love cows. <laughs> I, I can look them in the eye and say, oh, you're beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you go from no experience with cows or dairy farming to your mate getting in touch and saying, right, let's do this. That's right, but what about this though? Yeah. We hadn't been there for very long and the machines broke down. <laughs> so you can imagine milking 56 cows between the two of you twice a day. <laughs> <laughs> so so w w was there anything <coughs> that you could reach inside yourself and and that you took from your, your service in the army that helped you <coughs> when the machines broke down, even just being resilient oh, yes, yeah. about you, thinking look, I've got to get the job you, done? You just accept it. Mm -hmm. that, that's the thing. Whatever happens in life from then on, mm -hmm. you just accept it and say, well, I'm not in charge of anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. And uh, but then I didn't last too long uh, doing that. I, I was I was doing the pasture improvement mm -hmm. on a, in a Ferguson tractor. Well, you know, if you go up there a little bit of incline like that, you can go back like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're experienced anyway. Yeah, yeah. But <clears throat> I got the job done fertilising the the the, uh, the paddocks and. Uh, he, Bill was, uh, he was mending the fences and putting new fences up. Mm -hmm. And we improved the pot property so much, we entered the dairy uh, competitions for the South Coast, we won it. Wow, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and ha how long after setting it up was that? A couple of years? Um, uh, so that was the next year. Wow. Anyway, I sort of sold out to Bill and I thought, I'm not going to do this for the rest mm -hmm. of my life. Yep. Moved and on. I wandered around and went to various places and uh, did other various things and I thought about real estate and I did, uh, I, I got a job with Austin Brummer, he had a, he had been a prisoner of war and uh, he had a, a business in Epping mm -hmm. and he wanted someone to help him. Yeah. And I helped him so much that I sold seven houses in one day. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, the accumulation of people that I'd mm. shown houses to. But uh, that went on a bit. Austin had married a, a, a lady who had a grown up family and was uh, sending them to boarding schools and things like that and he, he had to make money yeah. to keep her Expensive, going. Expensive, yeah. But he was a nervous wreck. Mm -hmm. And we opened an, a, a, a shop at the Epping uh, station and he was in the one in the house. And one day uh, his wife phoned me and she said, oh, well, come down quickly. Austin just cut his wrists. Mm. So I raced down there and Austin was in the shower with an empty uh, scotch bottle mm. and a bottle of pills. Mm. And he was dead then. Gee. Blood all over the place, so I rang the police and the ambulance and 
And uh, that was that. But then I was we were there for three or four weeks, and I thought, well, there's no future in this. Mm. And so it's sad. He, you mentioned he was a, a person of war. Was he? Do you think, he, in hindsight, was that was post-traumatic stress? That, he, the reason why he took his own life. Do you think that was because yes, he went? Yes, he stressed war? from that. Yes. Yeah. Oh yes. And and then he was a nervous wreck because of that, and it compounded mm. when when he uh, needed money. Mm. So I, I th would like to hope that. We've learnt a lot of um, lessons from the mistakes of the past and not diagnosing Austin because he went to war and helping him transition oh, out no, of... Oh, no, 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 that's very sad, you know, very sad. So I hope... But, um, but see, the thing is this, uh, there are still people who have come back from after serving in the forces, who are nervous wrecks. Mm. I, I know there's one man. He lived in Belgala here, and he, he was he was he had been called up, and he was in New Guinea, and he, he was facing these gaps there. He's telling me about it, uh, about how how nervous he still was, mm. and he, his mate got killed alongside of him, and he still had uh, you know. They wake up during the night and mm. screaming. Well, you know, when I start hearing his stories and whatnot, you think of all the other people who have gone through it mm. during the other areas mm. of war. And did you ex experience many of them with your work at the diggers when you were acting as welfare officer there? Obviously, you would have seen well, similar. Oh, yes, well, I, I, I would see them. I'd, I'd, uh, Go and see them in war vets, mm -hmm. you know. Up, up at uh, Collaroy? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm. That's it. They, they are well looked after there. Mm -hmm. That's very good. Now they do a good job. Oh, yes. All the different houses and, yes. uh, well, I officiated uh, for the RSL part of the funeral for Megs Madigan. Mm -hmm. And Megs had been instrumental in, in, uh, creating uh, Hubble Diggers, hmm. anyhow. So, so but, but then uh, over the years, so I thought, well, I've got to stick to this job. And I have. Yeah, you certainly That's have. Full stop. Certainly have. But, and then, as far as the ones that needed help and uh, with Department of Veteran Affairs, I told you about that before, mm -hmm. how I represented them and worked hard on a number of them that, and the files are somehow that thick, you yeah. know, that I've got in the cupboard. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm sure their families and... They have been cooperative with me. Yep. Department. Good. So it's praiseworthy mm -hmm. that we do get help when we work hard enough to mm -hmm. convince them. <laughs> good, good. Um, so what about some, if, if you had three three tips for people that want to live a f long and fulfilled life what would they what would they be what what now that you're you know not far off your 104th birthday yeah what are the three things that 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 people can take from your knowledge to give themselves a fulfilled life well my tips are this to get to have a, a happy life you must always get hate and anger right out of your heart. Because it only comes back on you anyway. You think about it, how terrible you feel. If you hate somebody or something, and you're angry about something, you only feel bad yourself after it. You don't feel good. <laughs> you think about it. And to get that way, that you want to think about. When you get up in the morning, what do you think about? Think about somebody else that's worse off than you. But don't only think about them. Give them a call on the phone. Go and see them. 
Ask me how well they are. Go and help them. If they're sick, go and visit them in the hospital. And, and it's no good thinking about these things. Act on it. If anyone can think, but you must act and then you will be rewarded in your heart. So just think about those words. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility and self-control. I haven't got any of those, but I think about it. And I try and act. Well, action's the word. Get out and do it. Good luck to you. God bless you.